Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Uh, and that's that's it right there. The Mystery of Coal. <laughs> you like the title I came up with? It's a working title, but now I guess it's I like the it. official title. I like it because I, I thought, well, what could be the mystery of coal? And now I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's earth science, so I find it jazzmatastic. But uh, hey, you know this is one of the only sciences I can really get into. So, so did this one suck you in? Then I guess it sucked me in like uh, a fallen branch into a the depths of a peat bog. Oh my gosh, that was some great foreshadowing, <laughs> man! I can't wait for forty seconds from now when we start talking about that part. <laughs> but first, we got to tell everybody we're talking about coal. The title's correct. It's apt. It's accurate. And there is a mystery to the coal, which we'll get to, but there's a lot more to coal than just the mystery behind it. Um, And actually, the way that coal forms is super interesting. And it's been forming for a really long time. And it turns out, Chuck, humans have been using it for a really long time. There's evidence that the the people who inhabited China all the way back 5,500 years ago were burning coal that they found around the surface as a fuel, which is pretty impressive. And tailgating. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. They were tailgating? Sure. Burning coal, cooking up meat. Oh, I got you. Yeah. They were big time. They had um, <laughs> wooden pickup trucks. Right. They would <laughs> cook out of the back of You remember the stainless steel pickup trucks at the Atlanta Olympics? I have still never seen video of that. You're, you oh, just boy. talked about it like it was some... I've mentioned it before, haven't I? Yeah, nightmare. so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, you definitely have. Anyway, n- none of that has to do with wooden pickup trucks. This is what we're here for. No, it has to do with coal. So let's just say about 5,500 years ago, we started taking coal from the ground and burning it. And on a very small scale, that's a pretty clever thing to do. Unfortunately, as we'll see, we've really kind of taken that to the nth degree, starting in Mm -hmm. the Industrial Revolution. And it poses a lot of problems for the atmosphere that we'll talk about. But um, more to the point, because it takes so long to form coal, the rate that we're burning it at far Mm -hmm. outpaces the rate that it's being made at. Um, which makes coal a non-renewable resource, which we kicked off 5,500 years ago. But now, finally, Chuck, we've arrived to that thing you foreshadowed on, and that's how coal is made. So if you want to have a grasp on how long it takes to make coal, we're going to explain it step by step. That's right. And uh, I referenced peat bogs at the beginning, and people might have thought, what in the world is he even talking about with that? Sure. And why is Josh so excited that Chuck referenced that? (laughs) And here's the answer. Uh, peat is where coal begins. And peat is like, you know, sort of uh, loose layers of all kinds of uh, plant and mineral gobbledygook that accumulates in the forest in these swampy areas called peat swamps. Uh, you might call them bogs or mires, depending on where you live in the world. Mm-hmm. But these are wetlands that have really great conditions to swallow up a fallen branch or a plant or something like that or a a dead animal and have it slowly sink down to the bottom and kind of protect it from not completely from erosion, but from erosion that would happen if it was on land. Right, right. So like if you, so the reason why it's protected from that, from decomp, um, you know, like how a a body decays or um, uh, like on the body farm at University of Tennessee, or if um, you're talking about a wild animal in the forest or a mouse that got into your attic or a plant (laughs) that fell over in your backyard, all of that stuff decomposes, right? Uh Uh-huh. It doesn't really decompose in the swamp because a swamp, by definition, has um, basically stagnant water. Not much goes on in a swamp, strangely enough. Everything's just kind of very slow motion, biologically and geologically speaking. So that water, because it lacks oxygen, it's not a really great place for the microbes that carry out decomposition on planet Earth to live because they need oxygen to 
carry out those functions, to eat things and decompose them. And so the swamp water, being stagnant and oxygen poor, acts basically as a preservative for the stuff that lived along the swamp and has now died and fallen into the swamp and settled on the bottom, creating what's lovingly known as muck. That's right. And the really important part here, you might be saying, like, big deal, a bunch of stuff falls to the bottom of the swamp and kind of really, really slowly decomposes, if at all. The really important part here, and this is how we get to coal, which ultimately leads to why we have problems with climate change, is that carbon is locked down in place at, in the bottom of that swamp with that muck. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just sitting there. It's not, you know, if it was on dry land and it was a dead, I, I, can't, I don't like, mouse. I keep saying dead deer, mouse. dead mouse, sure. Uh it would decompose regularly and there would be an exchange of carbon happening pretty readily. But that's not the case at the bottom of a peat bog. That carbon is staying locked in and that that carbon will eventually become the energy that we need or burn as coal. Precisely. So there is some decomposition that happens, right? It's like if you look at swamp muck that eventually becomes peat, that eventually becomes coal, that swamp muck, you can't really make out like a fish or a tree limb or anything like that after a while. So sure. there is some decomposition, but the, the upshot of it is it doesn't fully decompose like it would if microbes got onto it on land, like you were saying. And that decomposition that microbes carry out, it unlocks all those chemical bonds that store chemical energy. It breaks up all of those um, constituent elements and compounds that that make up those bonds. Um, And then it spreads them out so that other plants can come along and use them. That doesn't happen in swamp muck. It just gets trapped, frozen in time, basically, to a certain part of decomposition. And you still say, so what? How does this make any sense? I'm reeling from all of this information. (laughs) Well, just settle down because we're getting to the next most important part. And that is that if you look at a swamp, say, the Okefenokee or swamps in Indonesia, if you went back far enough, you would probably be looking at something much deeper and more watery, like a pond or a lake. And those ponds and lakes end up filling in over time, right? Yeah, they, you know, they start at the banks, like you would think, and stuff drops in in the shallow areas and starts accumulating. And that just, and we're talking over the course of a long period of time. It's not like you're going to turn a lake into a swamp inside, you know, a couple hundred years. Yeah, just try it. Yeah, I've tried. Trust me, it's not working. (laughs) Uh, But that just expands further and further toward the middle. Eventually, that lake does turn into a swamp. uh, And eventually, that's going to turn into dry land. Mm -hmm. But that muck, that deposit and that muck remains there. But it's now got earth on top of it, Mm -hmm. like, you know, dry earth. And that, that's a lot of compression. That's a lot of weight, and that's a lot of soil. And depending on, and we'll get to this in a second, but depending on how deep you are and how much weight and how much pressure uh, is on top of you as muck, you're going to turn it into different things, uh, different kinds of coal. Yeah, definitely. So um, that pressure that you mentioned, that's like – the key ingredient in transforming muck to peat to coal. And we talked a little bit about this in the diamonds episode, I think. We had to have, definitely, yeah. because eventually you get beyond coal to graphite and then ostensibly from graphite onto diamonds. Yeah, but, from heat and pressure. Right, exactly. Um, and th- that's so, so. Diamonds, I guess, start out as swamp muck too. And uh, coal is kind of like the. The, the middle part of that long, lengthy process from muck to diamond, basically. Right. Um, but the, um, the— Great album title, by the way. Which, what was it? From Muck to Diamond. Oh, nice. That is good. I think that's like a—that's like if your band is really terrible at first, but then just gets better and better, there's your greatest <laughs> hits album title. Or if you're Neil Diamond and you really want to be on the nose. Right. But is there a muck? Who is Was like he ever a, muck? No, is there like a muck in the music world that he could have been doing duets? Oh, I don't think so, because he started out, uh, because that was in another episode, as a a writer in the Brill Building there for, what was it called? Tin Pan Alley? Tin Pan Alley. Neil Diamond did? Mm -hmm. He was Uh, a Tin Pan Alley guy, so he was never, he was never muck. How old is he? Like 150? 104. (laughs) (laughs) Man, I don't remember that little fact. He's on his way to True Diamond. That's <laughs> he is. He's graphite right now. Yeah. So sorry, Neil Diamond. So um, 
as the as more and more earth just gets deposited through the processes of erosion and deposition and like rivers springing up and like flood their banks and spread out stuff like more and more earth like builds up over that deposit of swamp muck that got laid down over time and the as more and more builds up ab- above it there's more and more weight and pressure pushing down and compressing and condensing it and eventually that peat turns into coal. But you can't just say that coal is like really old peat because the pressure is so tremendous and the heat, it's kind of like it cooks, um, it cooks the the peat into coal. So the heat and the pressure actually make it go through like a biogeochemical transformation and it becomes a sedimentary rock, something that's not at all peat. It's it used to be peat, but now it's something totally different. It's undergone a metamorphosis, which is pretty neat. Yeah, I mean it's awesome. All that moisture is just squeezed out. All the impurities are squeezed out, and you're left. But you're you know you're still left with those chemical bonds. And there, this this is a thing, and it's called coalification. And it's there's no better titled thing in earth sciences, I think, than coalification. No. And and very straightforward. The process of turning muck to peat is peatification. Yeah, I think you should just add ification onto every word to make it really easy to understand. Right, Neil Diamondification. Yeah, podcastification. Yeah, that's great. Now, we just became an earth science. <laughs> should we take a break? Yeah, let's, and then we'll come back yeah. and talk about the different types of coal. How about that? Sounds great. <laughs> We're back. We promised talk of different types of coal. Mm-hmm. Uh, if when you last left us, uh, peat has been squeezed out underground, and we're talking. Uh, I don't even think we said about two and a half to six and a quarter miles beneath the earth. Mm-hmm. That, so it, it's a long way down. It takes like that much compression to really start That's to right. turn peat into into coal. Right. So don't go. Uh, digging a 10-foot deep hole, throw some sediment in there and expect anything to happen. (laughs) Right. Because also, I don't know if we said this or not, but um, this process that we're talking about takes place over millions to hundreds of millions of years, depending on the situation and conditions. That's right. Long, long time. Uh, And so there are a few different things that this coal can turn into, or the peat can turn into, a few different types of coal. The first one is lignite. Uh, it is crumbly still at this point, and it's not black yet. It's sort of brownish, and you can still sort of see parts of the original plant material when it's lignite. Right. After that is bituminous coal, um, and that's the coal that most people are familiar with. It's far and away the most widely used coal, most li- most widely mined coal. There's just a lot of it on Earth, and that's just um, coal that's been cooking and and pressed longer than mm-hmm. lignite. Um, it's still known as soft, though, but it's not soft like to the touch. No, it's just compared to the next step, exactly. anthracite, it's soft. Yeah. So, yeah, it's called soft coal. And then, yeah, the next step after that coal is left alone for much, much longer. Um, and then there's, uh, again, you've you've added some sort of heat source. It's either that... Um, that original deposit of swamp muck has been moving, pushed down further and further closer to the Earth's core so that it's just warmer there than it is towards the surface. Or it happened to be deposited near, like, um, volcanic activity. So there's yeah. that kind of heat. So you got some heat. It's like it's in an oven. And the pressure, after a long enough time, you eventually come up with anthracite. And anthracite is like the money coal. Right. And that is officially hard coal. But it doesn't stop there. I think you mentioned something about Neil Diamond turning into graphite. That is sort of the final thing that it can become. Mm-hmm. And you might think, oh, graphite, that sounds great. Like that must be that must be the slowest burning best coal on the planet. But it's really not true because graphite, the their bonds, the energy bonds are so strong mm-hmm. that it takes a lot of energy to break those up. So it you know, like regular soft coal. 
And I think even anthracite, you can ignite it without a ton of energy. Right. But it's it's going to take a lot of energy to ignite graphite. Yeah, and that anthracite is sweet, sweet stuff. It doesn't take much energy to ignite it. As a low flame, it's um, low smoke. It's just beautiful stuff. It's just much, much rarer than the bituminous, bituminous coal that we, we know and <laughs> The <love>. bituminous? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not, nobody likes it. No. <laughs> so, um... Chuck, I think we should also mention at this point, um, because it's about here where I was like, wait, what about oil, you know? Mm -hmm. It turns out that oil and coal undergo virtually the same processes. It's just the location of where they started out and then the source material that really makes them differ. So coal, as we've seen, is made in swampy areas um, from land-based plants, and oil is just made in marine areas from sea-based life, basically. Yeah, it's really remarkable how, and I remember when we talked about like where oil comes from, it's a bit of a mind-blowing thing to understand. And I feel like coal kind of completes the the picture for me at least. Yeah, coal it completes. It just depends on where it is. Right. Or the or how it started to. Well, yeah, I mean, that's where it was when it started. I gotcha, I gotcha. Like uh, Tin Pan Alley. <laughs> Poor Neil Diamond. <laughs> So um, I had a feeling he would make an appearance. I don't know why. Uh, I guess because, you know, we were talking graphite. Once you talk sure. graphite, you're half a <laughs> skip away from talking about Neil Diamond. Because everyone knows he has uh, gold records, platinum records, and a whole wall full of graphite. <laughs> That's right. So um, I, I, it, it's not just us who understands coal. Like, we're just basically reporting what science has figured out. Science has a pretty... <laughs> Pretty great understanding of how coal forms, the processes it yeah. undergoes, all that stuff. Oh, right? like that you needed to point that out. <laughs> so um, it, we understand coal enough that we can actually even go back and say, like, "Hey, this seam actually probably came here," and we've got a little yarn we can tell you guys about where one load in particular, one coal, major coal seam, came from, uh, and the whole thing started all the way back in the Carboniferous period, which was really wet and really, really warm. Um, I think the average global temperature for the first half of the Carboniferous period was like 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 20 Celsius. That doesn't sound very warm, but consider that 2020, one of the, I think it was like the second hottest year on record, Mm -hmm. the global temperature was 58.76 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a good 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on yeah. average. That's a lot warmer for a global temperature. It is. Uh, and it's hard to wrap your head around a global temperature. But, yeah, and that's that's everything. Right. Not just where you live, you know, because when I first saw these numbers, I was like, could that be correct? But, yeah, you don't kind of – when you think of global averages, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, because, I mean, you're, you're not just taking the, the equator into, into um, account. You're also taking the poles into account. You're mixing it all together, yeah. carrying the one. So a, a bell goes <laughs> off when you finally reach the answer, and there you go. That's right. Uh, and there were a lot of swamps uh, back in those days, obviously. And uh, they were – a lot of them were around where the equator is, so it was going to be especially hot there. Mm-hmm. And one in particular near the equator was straddling, and I know we've talked a lot about tectonic plates in myriad episodes, including the volcanoes one. Mm -hmm. But one of them straddled a plate boundary uh, right where a couple of these plates met. Uh, And I guess we should say where it is. Uh, Present-day Europe, Asia, and North America Mm -hmm. was called Mm Laurasia. And then Gondwana, which is present-day Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, and India. Mm-hmm. And these guys started banging up against each other, as plates do when they when they meet and say hello. And mountain ranges are formed. And we know this is how mountain ranges are formed. But this particular mountain range was formed and then kept moving and kept moving until it eventually became the Appalachian Mountains. Right. And so as these, these massive supercontinents collided with one another and pushed into one another and, and created this mountain range... Um, as the the land that made the mountains went up, the land on either side of those mountains bowed down. Which was swampy, if you remember. Yes, and that's really important because when that that process took place, and it's not like they just ran into each other like a car crash or anything. This took place over a really long time. <laughs> but it was yeah. enough that it was it was dropping huge amounts of swamp muck and vegetation deep below the earth at a much faster rate 
then the succession of a lake to a pond to a swamp to dry land happens. Right. So it was dropping a bunch of swamp muck down on either side of it. And that, as that mountain range moved forward and, and settled in the northeast United States and southern, southern part of Canada, uh, it took the, those deposits with them, and then it baked and cooked for a couple hundred million years. And now you have the coal seams up in the, uh, the Appalachians right now. That's right. And this is no mystery. Like, it makes a lot of sense. We know why a lot of coal was formed then. Uh, it was the, the first part of the Carboniferous period, which is called the Mississippian Epoch. Uh, and like we said, it was really warm, and sea levels were a lot higher than they are now. And a lot of the land was underwater. There was a lot of sea, a lot of marine environment uh, environments where oil would form. And this was at the beginning. The Pennsylvania Epoch, epoch came next. And this is when the temperatures cooled down. And this was kind of the, the latter half of the Carboniferous period. That seawater is locked up in the ice toward the poles. Mm-hmm. The seawater retreats. And this is where you got those big swamps. And this is, you know, the Pennsylvania e- Epoch was when uh, – Basically, there was a huge spike in what would become coal. Yeah, so it makes total sense, and we understand why a huge deposition of the world's coal came from this particular epoch of the Carboniferous period. Because before that, everything was too much underwater for there to be swamps, and you need swamps to create coal, right? But the thing is, there's a mystery in that shortly after the end of the Pennsylvania period of, or epoch of the Carboniferous period, that that deposition of coal just drops off suddenly. So it's almost like there's this one slice of a, a of Earth's natural geological history where most of the coal that we find in the entire world was created. There's some before that. There's some still going on today. Coal's still being made. But the bulk of it, the vast majority, happened during this. And, and why? Why it started then, no mystery. Why it stopped around then, that has been a long-standing mystery, and here is, of course, where we get to the mystery of coal. <laughs> uh, that's right. And to explain the mystery, uh, I guess we got to get to sort of the second part of why there was so much coal, and that was due to the giant plants all of a sudden that were happening uh, happening during the Pennsylvania epoch. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a, just a lot of new plant diversity, and they were really, really big plants. Uh, they sucked up a lot of the CO2 in the atmosphere, emitted a lot of oxygen, and that made the plants grow biggy, biggy, big. And those big, big plants fell over into these swamps. And uh, so this that's sort of part two of, you know, if you have a lot of material all of a sudden and a lot bigger material, uh, then you can eventually get more coal. So we know all this stuff, and that's all well and good. But scientists started to look around again and say, like, we need to try and figure out, uh, and I guess, you know, it's an understanding of what happened in the past Mm -hmm. so we can understand what may happen in the future. It's a meta-narrative. It is a (laughs) meta-narrative. And so to get there, we, uh, to the mystery, we have to explain what lignin is, right? Yeah, so one of the one of the reasons all those plants were allowed to get so huge wasn't just that they sucked up all the CO2, it's that apparently around this time lignin appeared on earth. And lignin is what gives plant cell walls their sturdiness, um, their hardiness, um, makes it uh, difficult for them to break down after um, after they die, after they fall over and, and hit the swamp floor. Right. And so they said, okay, lignin came around around then. Maybe the reason why there was so much coal um, being laid down during that period and then it tapered off is because lignin showed up before anything that could break down lignin appeared on Earth. And then once that stuff came along, um, the, the, the deposition of coal dropped off dramatically. And that's what's called the uh, white rot appearance theory of where our coal came from or went. That's right. And it sounds so boring to, you know, the regular person on the street. But Does if it? you're an earth scientist, well, you think, you, know, you think it sounds pretty interesting? White rot theory? Yeah. <laughs> I think that sounds amazingly interesting. It's in, I, I feel like it's the, the, the theory title that only an earth scientist would love. But you're also an earth science uh, wonk. So, of course, you're going to. I guess I gonna, am. Turn your crank, you know what I mean? I guess I, my crank is spinning a million miles an hour right now. So they had this theory, and they started looking back. And the U.S. Department of Energy said, and this was in 2012, 
uh, they came out with a theory and said, hey, I, I bet you anything there was, this, there was this new kind of fungus that came on the scene that could take care of lignin like nothing else before it could take care of. Mm-hmm. And they said, I bet you dollars to donuts that this made an appearance right about that same time. And they went back and checked, and they were right. Yeah, they they analyzed the uh, genomes of a ton of different fungi from a class of fungi called wood decay fungi, which really lives up to its name. It's yes. one of the one of the few things on Earth that is capable of breaking down lignin. But boy, can it! Like if you've ever seen a bunch of weird shingle-like mushrooms growing out of the side of a fallen tree in the woods, yeah, that's a type of wood decay fungi. And if you've ever picked up uh, a piece of wood and it's just crumbled in your hands. That was because of the fungi. You can thank it for that dry rot. So they're really good at it, but they're doing that today. And they came along at some point in time. And when they analyzed the the genes of one kind, a white rot fungi, which is a mushroom-bearing fungus, um, they said, you know what? I think this actually came along toward the end of the Carboniferous period, beginning of the Permian period. And this is probably the reason why all of that coal deposition suddenly dropped off all of a sudden. Right, because now you have a situation where instead of dropping off, falling into a swamp, largely decomposed and sitting there forever, Mm -hmm. you've got it uh, falling down and, you know, the fungus doing its thing, just like we see more of today. (laughs) Yeah, it jumped on it like the bunny from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That's what, (laughs) that's how they pounce. Uh, Is this a good time for a break? I guess so, but I think we need to throw a little cliffhanger in there, Chuck, because... There's a lot of scientists out there that say, not so fast. You can take your white rot theory and shove it because I'm not convinced. I think that's a great cliffhanger. Thank you. All right. We'll we'll be right back. Okay, so some scientists have made the white rot theorists cry secretly in the bathroom at work, not openly, but they did cry. That's because they weren't very kind about it. They weren't. It was really mean. But um, they did make some really good points. And one of them is that, you know, we're not entirely certain. Maybe white rot ancestors showed up around the end of the Carboniferous period. It's possible. But that's not to say that there's nothing that could break down lignin that existed before that. So maybe there was something already, and you can actually see evidence of it from fossilized plant material that are partially decayed. Um, How would they have been at all decayed if there wasn't anything that could break down lignin before white rot came along? Yeah, so something was breaking stuff down. Uh, this may have sped it up or whatever, but mm-hmm. something was already happening. Right. And it appears, and I might, let me know if I have the wrong take on this. Okay. But it appears what they're saying as an alternate uh, theory is maybe there was not a big drop off more so than there was just a weird anomalous spike. Yeah. Because of these tectonic plates uh, crashing together. And all of a sudden it happened to happen where all this swampland was. Mm-hmm. And that just really sped things up. So what we saw then was uh, like what we're seeing today maybe is more on the order of just kind of how it normally is. And there was just a big spike because there was a big spike because of these tectonic plates happening. And all of a sudden this huge deposits of stuff in the swampland being buried underground. Yeah, like it, that's, that's precisely right that, that we've been looking at it the wrong way. It's it's not like that was the normal process of coal making. It just so happened that there was this period of time in Earth's history where the, the conditions were perfectly right to make a bunch of coal all at once. And that window eventually closed and the, the continents broke up and they took their coal seams with them around the world. This See, this is the stuff that really fascinates me about earth sciences is sort of the sliding doors thing like had that not happened we would not have had coal on the order that we have today at Mm -hmm. all Mm -hmm. and like what what would how would that have changed the world and how would that have changed the industrial revolution absolutely or maybe prevented the industrial revolution from happening because i guess we'd what still be burning wood i guess who knows we'd be we'd have figured out how to burn diamonds maybe 
Yeah, it's just really interesting that this, you know, tectonic plates millions and millions of years ago yeah. uh, ends up affecting, like, well, as we'll see, the Earth's climate today, but how we get around in the world and, yeah. like, the energy we consume. And not just tectonic plates, but it, the the happenstance that there was the appearance of lignin, which allowed all of this yeah. stuff to, all these plants to diversify and explode in size. And that, it's fascinating. And that, yeah, it is. It, it took all of these different little factors to make the coal that we see today uh, so abundant. Because, yeah, if that hadn't happened, if we didn't have these abundant um, deposits— um, who, yeah, who knows where we would be or what we would be doing for for energy, and and that is the thing because we are definitely using a lot of coal for energy, and as a result, we're um, we're, we're wrecking the planet. There's really no other way to put it. It's definitely not just be, because of coal, but coal has definitely been a huge culprit because we've yeah. been using it for so long. Again, it it, it powered the industrial revolution, um, and then uh, also because it is just such a dirty energy source it is uh but here's the thing when used as an energy source it's a dirty energy source if that coal were uh were not extracted and it just you know the the plant matter fell into the swamp Mm -hmm. and and it and it decomposed very slowly down there and eventually became uh you know the three stages of coal or i guess the four stages of coal it, it would just stay that co2 would stay locked down in there Yes, it's uh, it actually acts as a a sequesteror, I guess, <laughs> yeah. to keep that carbon locked underground, uh, where it would have stayed had it not been for us. Yeah, so that makes it a, a carbon sink. Um, That's better than sequesteror. <laughs> it is a sequesteror. <laughs> reminds me of that kids in the hall eradicator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, but it, uh, being a carbon sink, that makes it a really major part of the carbon cycle, which is this shuffling of carbon throughout the earth into the oceans, into the atmosphere. And that actually acts as Earth's thermostat. Because like we were talking about, when all those plants came along in the Mississippian epoch of the Carboniferous period, they the more and more plants sucked more and more carbon dioxide out of the air, which actually cooled global temperatures, right? So less carbon in the atmosphere equals lower lower uh, temperatures, more carbon in the atmosphere equals higher temperatures. And so over time, as that carbon moves slowly from atmosphere into rock and then released again into the atmosphere, th- that just keeps temperatures stable generally, globally, yeah. within a range. Um, and coal plays a big part of that. But we have radically accelerated the pace of release of that carbon from those the carbon sink that is coal back into the atmosphere by digging it up and burning it and not just um not just speeding it up by 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 um you know setting it on fire rather than letting it erode naturally over time but also just the massive amounts that we burn have had a, a terrible effect well yeah i mean you make a good point you know this coal like an earthquake might push this coal seam above ground eventually, Mm -hmm. and that exposes it to the atmosphere, but it's still going to be releasing that CO2 very slowly because it's not on fire. Right. Then the point you made was like, there may be an unlucky thing, like, you know, lightning might hit it and light it on fire or something like that. But save that or, or some human coming along and doing it, it is going to be a really slow sort of natural process, mm-hmm. and you're not going to see these big spikes of CO2 being released. Yeah, so a good um, a good reference, point of reference, is volcanoes are like the biggest emitter of carbon from the Earth uh, back into the atmosphere. It, they, it literally melts rock that contains carbon, including coal, and shoots that, that out as like volcanic emissions uh, back into the atmosphere. Uh, on a given year... Volcanic activity releases between 130 and 380 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. Okay. On a given year, humans release 30 billion metric tons <laughs> of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Holy cow. So, yeah, and coal is a big, big part of that. Um, and it just kind of gives you an idea of, like, just how lopsided things are becoming. So, hence, we reach that point where global warming, even though it's hot or it's cold and there's freak weather and weird weather, and it's like, what does global warming even mean? We are contributing to global warming by releasing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which warms the atmosphere, warms the surface of the oceans, which leads to ocean acidification, the sea levels rise, and a whole 
cascade of really unpleasant stuff is happening and is about to happen that we're all going to have to adapt to and get used to. Yeah, I think we've, it's interesting. I don't, we've never done one solely on climate change, have we? I think we have. Oh, have we? I I believe we have. Maybe global warming itself. I don't remember, but I feel like we have done that. All right, because I just, I kind of thought that we had covered it pretty fully in bits and chunks in yeah. a lot of different episodes, which really sort of spells very clearly out that, you know, there are so many reasons and so much, there's so much history to it. Like, I, I mean, I guess we probably did cover it in one episode, but I just, the, the, the tendrils of climate change are so far reaching. Like it's not, it's not a surprise that it's made appearances in like yeah. dozens of our episodes. For sure. But I think that's one of the things I like about our job is like, you know, there's everybody knows that like CO2 contributes to climate change, but you and I have the opportunity to like kind of take it slow and slow things down and explain it in a little more detail, you know, so that yeah. people who listen to us can can be like, oh, yes, that's true. And I know why, you know. Right. I think yeah. that's neat. It's a very rewarding job that we have, Chuck. It is. We're lucky dudes. We are lucky. Um, you got anything else? I got nothing else. This was a fun one, kind of uh, short and sweet, but dense like coal. That's right. Uh, well, if you want to know more about coal, there's a lot of stuff to read, a lot of stuff, surprising amount of stuff on coal out there. Um, and it's kind of fun. Uh, and since I said it's kind of fun, that means it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this from an Aussie friend of ours. Uh, hey, gents. Sending a hello all the way from Australia land. Uh, like many of your listeners, I re- never really had a reason to write in other than to thank you guys. Until the other day, that is. Uh, recently, in one of your newer, uh, new episodes, Josh made a point to clear any possible confusion about the way people should interpret the title of the show. He explained that he was unsure whether people should be, or would be saying it is stuff you should already know or cool stuff we think you should know. It's funny, you were just kind of talking about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with that out loud brain fart of an F overthought, I finally had my reason to get in touch. It's like you were speaking to me and I didn't even know it. Uh, and here goes the explanation. Okay. Growing up in a home with a single mom and a protective one, uh, there were a lot of very basic yet potentially dangerous things that I was not allowed to do or even learn how to do. The logic being, if I didn't know, I wouldn't try it and I wouldn't get hurt. Uh, (laughs) This was just so, so great until I was an adult out in the real world with no idea how to use a can opener. So now there's me uh, searching for a cool new podcast to listen to. And I see one called Stuff You Should Know. And swear to Steve Irwin, my first thought was, (laughs) bloody hell, they might be able to teach me how to use a can opener. Oh, wow. Yeah, Uh, okay. Uh, of course, instead, what I found was an absolute behemoth of a discography uh, with more amazing stories, topics, and jokes than I could ever have wished to hear about, or even uh, even if I lived to be 100. Uh, I've now listened to all the episodes and can't wait for the new ones through the week. I don't really need to be a listener mail. Uh, the fact that it seems you guys genuinely read these is amazing enough to me. Hope you guys and your families are well and staying safe. Keep it up, you bloody effing legends. Cheers. That is from Jackson in Canberra, Australia. Nice. Thanks, Jackson. Canberra? Canberra. Canberra? Mm hmm. All right. Um, I, I really brushed up before our Australian tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice work. That was a great email, Jackson. Like one of the, one of the better ones we've ever gotten. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think practice makes perfect with a, with a can opener. Okay. I, I nice just, for you to close that circle. I don't, yeah, and I don't think I could I could explain it. No, I'm, I'm thinking of it, and I don't think I can. So just give it Depends a few on the shots. Can opener. Yeah, you mean I have one that goes on the top, mm-hmm. and it it actually like breaks the seal between mm-hmm. the the top of the can and the actual can. And I it took me several times. I think I actually went and looked it up online how to use that one because I'm like so it cuts around the side and takes the whole lid off. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those. Those are good. Yeah, I'd seen them too. I'd never tried to use one before, and it's not intuitive. So it's, I guess yeah, you're right. Yeah, my advice, Jackson, is to just go look up a couple of how-to videos on the internet, and and they will explain how can openers work. And that means by proxy, I've just explained how can openers work. <laughs> or buy one of those great 
old school 70s pea green electric yeah. can openers and set it on your counter. Those are awesome. Yeah, you want to talk about home defense. Just like yeah. keep a couple <laughs> of those lids laying around. You can throw yeah. them like throwing stars at intruders. Yeah, ninja stars. And Man, those coming. things were dangerous. Is there anything in the 70s that wasn't dangerous? I don't think so. I don't either. Remember the strollers back then? Good Lord. Sure. Well, we could go on like this forever, but I can hear John Hodgman rolling over in his grave, and he's not even dead yet. <laughs> he pre-rolls, though, just to you know get the practice in. Right. So if you want to get in touch with us like Jackson did, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.